let's get started. Let's redo that intro. Um, I'm Elise. If we haven't met, I am Victor's fiance. Um, he's the loud one in the relationship. <laughs> uh, this is Nid. This is our co-host. They can't see you. You got a duck. And yeah, I'm here to talk about 3D printing and cosplay today. <laughs> Um, I'll be doing some giveaways at the end of the panel if anybody would like to win some cursed objects. I have a, a cursed Kirby to give away, and I'll be giving away some controller stands as well if you want to display your controllers. All cute. Okay. Anyway, let's get started. Um, so typically when I host this panel, it's at like anime conventions. So a lot of my stuff that I have to show you for, I'll be like awkwardly holding in front of the webcam and hoping it goes in focus, so but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so welcome everybody to my panel. In our technology-packed world that we live in, there's a dozen of computer-controlled machines available to makers like us. So a CNC machine can carve things like metal and stone, a laser cutter can etch wood, but to me there's nothing cooler than the literal power of alchemy that a 3D printer can provide you. So I can tell you from a lot of experience that 3D learning how to 3D print things might not always be fun, but it'll definitely be rewarding. So it can be an overwhelming amount of clogged print heads, unlevel beds, and unruly 3D models. But if you persevere, you can make a lot of really cool stuff. So let's get started. So here's a quick summary of everything I'll be going over today. I'll be showing you how I got into the field, some of the stuff I've made, and how you can get started 3D printing yourself. But first, before we begin, I have some questions for you guys. So 3D printing is such a mysterious and magical topic that I really want to see how you guys view it from like an outsider's perspective. So to start, how many of you guys have a 3D printer at home? Yeah, Kat, she'll be here the whole time, don't worry. <laughs> I'll just be multitasking, petting her and presenting at the whole time. Okay, so I don't think Anybody in the chat has one, but that makes it good. So anybody who has a 3D printer, you're not allowed to answer any of these questions, okay? You guys have to sit out. <laughs> so how much do you guys think a 3D printer costs? Like, just start throwing out numbers. A thousand, three thousand, six, six hundred to two thousand dollars. Million dollars, they're not that expensive. Okay, so... This diva gun was printed on a 3D printer that cost 240 Canadian. So, and that includes the shipping too. <laughs> oh, so how much do you think I spent on materials to print this diva gun? So how much do you think it cost me to 3D print this? $20 for materials, $50. So this gun in material cost was about $3.50. <laughs> so finally, last question is how long do you think it took me to print this? Like how fast do you think the 3D printer printed out this gun? <laughs> I know I'm ready. I'm ready and I'm here to blow minds today. Eight hours, three hours a week. So two and a half days. So this one was actually printed in four separate pieces and it was about 24 hours in total for those separate pieces. But depending on your settings, you could definitely do it a lot faster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice to meet you guys. Um, my name's Elise and online I go by Porzel and Cosplay. So I've been a cosplayer since 2013 and a 3D printing fanatic since 2016. Um, and as of 2020, I've been printing things for four years now and I have four 3D printer robot children sitting in my closet right now. So I've been doing 3D printing commissions for the last three years or so, and recently my Etsy shop is just about at 1,000 sales. I'm like five sales away. So back in 2018, I started doing panels to teach others about the magic of 3D printing, and this is, I think, my sixth or seventh time doing this presentation. And so to be honest, I just really, really love 3D printing. <laughs> I think it's a really amazing tool that can empower people's creativity and help them make some really cool stuff. So I'm excited to share with you guys some of the things and my experiences that I've done today. So this is my office, not quite up to date because I've shoved a fourth printer in there and it's not as clean. So I don't, I didn't update the picture. Uh, let me show you. I have fancy transition courtesy of Orni Owo in the chat. Let me show you. That's my current closet. It's got my four 
My four children slaves. Oh, this is Nid. If you want to say hi to Nid real quick. Those are my, my most recent uh, office photos. But yeah, I haven't cleaned it, so I don't want to show it too much. <laughs> so I managed to fit four of my printers into my office closet, along with my never-ending collection of filament. So each of those plastic rolls of colorful spaghetti, that's a roll of filament. And I go through approximately 10 kilograms of filament a month. It depends. Sometimes I go through a lot more. So I'm constantly rotating my stock. No, you can't spam Nid Pats today. <laughs> In my normal Twitch channel, I have a channel point redemption where you get to pet Nid and I'll pet her for you. So here's some of my cosplay works that I've made. So when people think of 3D printed cosplay, they typically think of like really big stuff, like giant Iron Man suits or big chunky pieces of armor. But in reality, it can be so much more than that. So in each of these cosplays that I've made, there's been something crafted using 3D printing. So it could be something small, like the gems I use to print a mold, or to print the gem and then create a mold and then cast with resin. Or it could be something a lot more obvious, like the giant props I did for Mercy. So what I'm saying is that you can make a lot more than you imagine using a 3D printer, and I'm really excited to share with you guys the possibilities today. But before you get to printing cool stuff like that, you'll end up with a few prints like this. So despite common misconceptions, 3D printers are not smart. They're not like an inkjet or a laser printer where you pick a file, you press print, and the print magically appears from thin air. So they're more like a tool that requires some knowledge to operate. And until you learn the basics, you'll end up with some prints like these. Heck, I still end up like prints like these, and I've literally been printing for years now. Your supports can fail, your beds can be unlevel, your nozzle can clog, your filament can absorb too much moisture, there can be uneven bed adhesion. Honestly, the list of things that can go wrong is very, very long. But thankfully, the 3D printing community is very welcoming. There are plenty of forums, Facebook groups, and other communities that are around to help you out if you have any questions or problems. So shown here is a really good troubleshooting guide from the Simplify 3D website, which goes over dozens of common problems and how to fix them. So online, there's also a ton of other resources available for if you're ever having any problems. There's also a common misconception that a more expensive printer will give you better results. While this is partially true, it certainly does not mean you can not get high quality prints off of a low priced 3D printer. So shown here is an example of a print of my cheapest 3D printer, which was the $240 Canadian one. So thin lettering is notoriously difficult to print, often requiring very thin layers to even get it legible. But if you put the time to tinker, calibrate, and maintain your machine, these results are more or less possible to have on any printer. This wasn't even printed on like a super thin layer height either. This was on my standard 0.2 millimeter layer height. So before you get to printing big pieces, it's a good idea to print some smaller prints to see if you have any issues. So these prints alone are some of the only ways to diagnose problems, so they're super important. So these tiny boats are called benchies, and they're basically a benchmark for 3D printing. So they were carefully designed to be a challenging print that showcases a ton of weaknesses, such as overhangs, slopes, and small text. So when I used to work at my office job, I had like a ton of these tiny little boats sitting on my desk and my coworkers actually just thought I was really weird and like collecting tiny boats. <laughs> so in this box, which I sadly can't pass around, but in this box, I have a whole bunch of calibration prints of, oh, sorry, my print just finished. I have all of my, a whole bunch of them. I don't keep all of them. And like this one, I literally printed like two days ago and my nozzle was clogged and I had to fix it and yeah, they're very important. So this diva gun was the first cosplay pop that I've ever printed. So I printed it for my sister in the fall of 2016 for Animathon, since neither of us really knew how to finish props in the beginning. So we didn't really do any steps to it after printing to make it look nice. And looking at it now, it's actually really, really bad. So like the amount of warping on the edges is atrocious and there's huge visible layer lines that make it look extremely mediocre, and not to mention that it could use a lot more sanding. Let me, let me let you zoom in on the, the shitty diva gun. Like, it looks good, but look at that seam! Look at how horrible it is, and look at this, like, split at the top. Look at that, there's a big ga gaping hole there. It's horrible. Anyway, so when I started doing panels, I printed out another one, like the exact same file, the exact same type of filament, and the exact same printer, just like with more optimized settings. And this is the new and improved Diva Gun. So that's how much learning and just knowledge in general can improve your 3D printing experience. 
So over time, I've become more comfortable with my printers and my settings, and I started offering commissions. So here, shown here is a whole bunch of uh, commissions that I printed for other people that the models were available online, and I just printed them for free. Since online, there's actually a ton of free models available, especially for like mainstream cosplay stuff. However, to get to the true potential of 3D printing for cosplay, you gotta learn how to make the stuff yourself. So sure, there's a ton of free models online, but what if it's something really niche? So I taught myself how to use Fusion 360 to create even more projects. So shown here are some of my files that I've created as commissions for my clients or for my own personal cosplay projects. The horns. I know, I have a lot of horns, actually. <laughs> They're like one of my favorite things to model. It's so fun. So I've done crazy big stuff, like model and print this giant five-foot-tall Ganondorf sword. Which, no, I'll never print one of these again, so please don't ask. It's it's horrible. They're too... Five feet is too long for a sword. So I've done smaller stuff. Like, I've created all the trophies for the past few Anime-thon gaming events and the Extra Life Edmonton events. And yes, if you're wondering, I'm making up some really cool trophies for this year's Extra Life Game Day event that's happening in a couple weeks. And this past May, I was actually laid off of my full-time office job. So I've taken my 3D printing side hustle to full-time status. So over the summer, I've gotten to model and create a ton of really cool cosplay props for people. And it just makes me really happy that I get to help so many people make their dream cosplays a reality. So why should you choose to 3D print something over a making it with another material, such as EVA foam or warbler? That's, that's Nid, by the way. <laughs> Um, so one of my favorite aspects about 3D printing is that it can print while you're doing other things. So my printers in the back here are running literally 24-7, constantly working on my next project or commission. Like, they're literally printing money, you guys. So another thing is, once you buy a printer, it is so cheap to print out props. Like, you saw that Divagon, it was literally $3.50 to print it, but I could sell that easily for, like, $30-$40. There are also thousands of free models available that you can print to get you started and hundreds of tutorials online to teach you how to 3D model if there isn't a model already available. The downside with printing out uh, 3D printed items is that you have, to you have to buy the printer to start off with and then it can take a lot of tinkering to get quality prints and you might not always know how to solve the problems that you're coming across from. It also can be delicate if improper settings are used, which I learned with the tragic death of my Mercy staff. <laughs> which was one of my first props I ever printed. Um, the post-processing can require a lot of sanding, and there's very clear limitations to what you can actually 3D print. So now we're past the gloomy cons, and I'm excited to share with you guys some really cool stuff. So as cosplayers, we're super resourceful in creating our costumes out of dozens of materials and methods. So I think that owning a 3D printer as a cosplayer is such a powerful tool in creating bigger and greater things, Excuse me, and not just for printing out replica diva guns or suits of armor. So simply by using different types of filament, you can already achieve some really cool stuff. So for example, with this guy, it's printed with translucent filament. Let me hope I charge this guy. And you can make magical glowing props with the help of LEDs and Arduinos. And yeah, I love this thing. <laughs> um, what else can you do? So this one's super cool, but you can 3D print onto fabric, embedding the plastic into the fabric itself. So for this guy, you literally start up your printer, let it print like the first couple layers of plastic, and then you put a piece of porous fabric like tool, just wrap it around the bed, and then continue the rest of the print. And then you have, oh, let me, I shouldn't have switched back to my full screen mode because I have so many to show you. I have this one, which is like a whole bunch of scales and it's like attached. And this would be so easy if you were like doing a Monster Hunter cosplay to just glue this down to your foam and just bam, instant scales. And that can also be used for other things. So like this one's like mermaid scale print. Nid, please don't take that. Uh, and this one's a different type of scales. There's honestly so many really cool things you can do with this one. And then with the same method, you can also incorporate this Oh, Nid. <laughs> With the same method, you can incorporate this into making like floating jewelry. And I've actually used this technique on my Zelda cosplay to make the earrings since they were like a Triforce and they had like floaty bits in it. I made it so that they were like floating, like the real thing. So the downside of printing with that plastic is that it's hard and you can't stick it in a machine. However, there's different types of materials. So for example, this one is a rubbery type of plastic. So you can stretch it embed it into the fabric, and this could be super helpful with like extremely complex embroidery designs or with fabric patterns that are difficult to find. So like, let me show you. 
Like this one? Yeah. <laughs> this one's not as fun to show you over webcam. It's so much cooler to get to play with it in real life. So I've actually used this technique on a couple of my cosplays. So this was a tester piece that I used from my Zelda. But I literally printed the rubber fabric or the rubber filament into it and then ironed it. So like it's fully embedded and then I painted it gold after. Nid, no. Sorry. <laughs> Nid, you can't play with the highlighter right now. <laughs> So I've used this technique on my Zelda. I use this on my Anna costume as well for all that embroidery. I literally just, for the Anna one, it was a little bit different because the piece of fabric was so big that I literally just printed out little rubber stickers essentially and just ironed them into the fabric and fused them in. Um, another cool technique is 3D printing visor bucks. So if you have like a super complex shaped visor for your mask, you can print basically like the outside shape of it and use it into a, um, what's the term called? A vacuum former. And you can get the exact shape exact shape of visor that you need. <laughs> so another one, it sounds pretty simple as well, but customized gems. So it's really easy to find gem models online or to make your own. So scale it to whatever size you need, sand, or print it out, sand it, and then make a mold, and then you can cast it in whatever sparkly magical material you'd like to do. So I've used this basically on every single time that I have to make gems for a costume. And next up, we have 3D printed chain mail. So chain mail in real life is normally super heavy and super expensive, no less. But what if you could 3D print it? <laughs> so this is a huge advantage over actual printed chain mail due to the incredible difference in weight. So it takes a very dialed in 3D printer to print this because they're all intersecting rings printed one, like all together at one time. So it's a fairly tricky print to do. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then this one's pretty self-explanatory, but stencils. This one's like super practical in real life. This is how I made Vic slash Nid's Asa chair, because Nid, Nid claimed it. It's her chair now. So I literally just take the logo in its SVG form, so just like a vector file, and then I can easily just throw it into my modeling program and make it like a millimeter thick, print it out, and then, and then you have custom stencils or whatever you want. How does it not break? Oh, the chain mail? Because it's intersecting. Like, they're all... They're all together. They're all one happy family. Hi, Jen. Um, another one that's really cool is that these gauntlets were printed in flexible filament, so there's no sharp edges. Which, I can tell you from making, like, hand armor myself with, like, plastic, is that it hurts. It's so painful to wear sharp armor on your fingers for costumes. So with these ones, she printed them in rubber filament and then heat formed them. So once you heat it up and then like let it cool in the shape it needs to be, it will stay in that form. So by printing this, you can custom shape them to whatever size you want. And plus it looks super legit and then they're actually comfortable. So this one, this full arm um, was made by Loom Cluster, who's one of my favorite makers. And she created this automail arm entirely out of 3D printed materials. So every single piece on it was 3D printed with the majority of it being with flexible filament. So, fun fact about flexible filament is that in order to sand it, you actually have to use diamond tip Dremel bits because it's just such a sturdy and tough material that you literally need diamonds to sand it. So this one's another really cool one, is creating 3D printed Warbla. So for those who aren't cosplayers, Warbla is basically just like a big sheet of thermoplastic. So it's just a big sheet that you can cut out to whatever shape and then heat it up and you can form it. But like with 3D printers, you can create essentially a 3D printed version. So like for this, which is one of mine. Um, I just trace, or how you normally make patterns if you're a cosplayer is you just like tape up your leg with saran wrap and then slap tape on it and then cut it out. And then you have like an exact shape you have. And then you just pull it onto your drafting program and draw it out. And in our case, we put all of the details we want onto it from there. And then you can just heat it up with your heat gun and then heat shape it around your leg. So this one, this one fits on my arm. I think if anybody had a bigger arm, it wouldn't fit them. But yeah, it was all 3D printed. So this method has so many possibilities because you can do super fine detail like the filigree, which would actually be a total pain in the butt to do with by hand with war blood to cut all those out. So on the right hand of the screen is an example taken to another level by like multi-layering the pieces. And so not only is it gorgeous, but it's like super, super strong. <laughs> so another really cool technique, which isn't talked about 
about too much because it's kind of complicated, but it's called velocity painting. So basically you can imprint any image you want onto a 3D print by varying the speeds of the print itself. So using this technique, you can add texture to an image that's otherwise smooth without directly editing the 3D model itself. Since every single time a 3D printer like changes speed, there's going to be a slight lag, so you can it'll leave imprints on the print itself. So like, it's kind of hard to see on these examples, but I have a couple to show you. Um, so this one was on transparent filament. So you can see, it's really hard to focus. Oh my gosh, how do the beauty YouTubers do it? But there's like flowers imprinted to it. You see that? And like this one, it's got like puzzle prints imprinted. You can see it through the light. There we go. You can see that. Yeah. It's really fun. I know the people who come up with this stuff are so smart. Okay, back to slideshow. So another cool thing you can do is incorporating it with other cosplaying techniques. So like most people like to make armor out of foam because it's a lot more lightweight and you don't have to do any sanding really. So you can emboss your foam prints with stamps made that you 3D printed. So making that design would be a total pain in the butt to do it by hand. I don't even know if you could do it. But just by heating the foam up, you're, it's a lot more pliable. So you can just stamp the design you want in it. And then it's an easy way to add an otherwise complicated design to your foam. Another one is for my KDA Iri tail. I literally ripped the tail mesh from the game and then converted it into a printable, uh, printable file. And then I just chopped it up to be big enough or small enough to fit onto my printer and then assembled it. So I even 3D printed the harness used to strap it to my body. <laughs> and then finally, um, since 3D printing, you can get me measurements down to the precise millimeter. You can create really strong, lightweight and accurate mechanics for creating a ton of things. So these wing frames were printed with all 3D printed connections with a lightweight aluminum frame. So these wings can spread over eight feet when they're fully extended. And honestly, I'm super excited to make these when I finally find a character with wings that I want to make. Okay, so now that you guys have seen some really cool things to make with 3D printing, let's quickly get through the basics of 3D printing. There are several different types of 3D printers available, each using a different type of technology. So obviously there's different budgets when buying a printer and different limitations to every machine. Fun fact, there's actually 10 different methods of 3D printing, from using resin to powder to plastic. There's plenty of different types of machines that are all technically all 3D printers. But don't worry, only two of these actually are possible for home use, so I don't talk about any of the other ones, because I don't know how they work. <laughs> so first up, we'll be talking about the printers that I use, which is FDM. So currently FDM are the most common type of hobby printers, taking up around 85% of the 3D printing market. Think of this type of printer like a hot glue gun. So when you squeeze the handle, the glue gets pressed against a heating element and soft spaghetti-like strands come out from the nozzle. So imagine swirling those strands around on top of each other, one another off top of one another, forming circles that build up into a tube. And as the glue cools, it hardens. So continue that for hundreds or thousands of layers and eventually a physical model will appear before your eyes. So this is the type of printer we'll be focusing on since it's what I have and it's a lot more user-friendly than other materials. So alternatively, there's also SLA resin printers, which use a UV sensitive resin that cures under light. So with SLA printing, you can get super detailed prints and it's ideal for really complicated objects and models. So recently in the last year or so, there's been several hobby priced SLA printers showing up on the market. However, the cost of materials for printing is still pretty pricey. Unless your main goal was printing miniatures for D&D, it's not really ideal for cosplay use, specifically since the resin is a lot more expensive and the build volume is a lot smaller. So think the average phone screen size is about how big you can print. There's also a lot more necessary steps you have to take to maintain an SLA printer. So you have to use a lot of chemicals to clean off the resin and then you have to deal with the chemical waste byproducts of that. So I don't really talk about SLA much because I don't have one. But now that they're getting so cheap, like they literally had one on sale for like 250 bucks the other day. And I was so tempted to buy one, but I'm holding off because like there's such a commitment because also I have carpet and I don't want to deal with resin in a carpeted room. But anyway, both of these methods have their pros and cons, but I'll stick with FDM for now because that's what I know. So I contacted an SLA 3D printing company, Form 3D, for a sample print, and they graciously provided me with one. Um, two seconds, I gotta find it. There we go. So this is an example print on a butterfly that was printed on a $4,000 SLA 3D printer. It's so cute. So it's pretty wild that things like this are achievable and that like, there's not a single layer line on it. It doesn't look 3D printed. So if this is like the type of detail that you're looking for, there are definitely 
I definitely think SLA is the way to go. But if you're looking to make like that light up sword, you'll have to go with FDM. Okay, so enough about big scary explanations on how 3D printers work, because I know a lot of people don't really want to listen to that. But let's go through the steps if you'd actually want to make something. So in September of 2018, when the Bowsette trend started, I had a very crazy week. So I created a 3D model of the crown for a friend, and then I actually ended up selling over 30 of them in like two weeks. So you can say that I like the Bowsette trend, so... <laughs> I finished a couple of these crowns, and I think they're a great example of a small prop for a newbie to tackle. So what do we need to make one of these Bowsette crowns? And step one is to obviously find a 3D printer. So for this example today, I'm going to be using my Ender 3, which is my cheap go-to printer that I use, and it's one of my main printers. So I actually have three Ender 3s in the, in the robot children closet working right now. They're working hard, I love them. But if you don't have a 3D printer and are too afraid to get one right now, because of other commitments. Um, there are other options. So for example, the Edmonton Public Library has one available and they charge you about 10 cents per gram of filament, but you do have to be wary of a long wait list. So there's also a similar program at the U of A library open to students, staff, and alumni. So for reference, if you were printing out the Diva gun, which is about 500 grams of filament, it would cost about $50 to print at the library. So they're, they're definitely making a buck off of you too, because it only costs like $3. You can also order your prints to be printed online professionally by a company like Shapeways, which can print them... Oh, sorry. Mid! She doesn't want to listen to me anymore. Come back! Anyway. <laughs> um, you could have that printed by Shapeways, who can print it in a ton... Like, remember at the slide with all the crazy printers that use all the materials that were like $40,000? That's what Shapeway has. So, like, you can print it in, like, solid gold if you wanted to. So another alternative is that you could reach out to other local makers and commission them for better rates, like me. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> so step two is modeling. So I created this model myself once the whole trend started, but since it's such a popular item, there's a ton of them available for free now. So if you're printing really popular things, you can often find models online easy peasy. However, if you're planning on buying a 3D printer for cosplay as your main purchase, I really recommend taking a stab at learning 3D modeling. Because after you learn the basics, it opens up a whole new world for your cosplays. There's nothing quite as satisfying as modeling something yourself and seeing it come to life before your eyes. So for my 3D modeling, I use the program Fusion 360, which is free for students and hobbyists. And there's a ton of great tutorials on YouTube to get you started, and I even have a few of my own as well. So like shown here is a couple time lapses from my YouTube tutorials. Um, one of the easiest way to make models in Fusion 360 is by simply tracing an image and then extruding it into 3D. By simply laying it down a reference image and tracing over it, you can already create so many cool things. Add a few curved edges, some different thicknesses, and boom, you've already got yourself a prop. But there's tons of other modeling options too, like Blender, ZBrush, or Tinkercad for absolute beginners. Of course, there's a ton of different programs out there for 3D modeling. I like Fusion since it's a CAD-based modeling software and I took CAD in school so that just magically clicks with my brain really easily. Um, it's also free, which is also a major perk. Um, this is a totally outdated screenshot, but um, I host streams on Twitch when I do 3D modeling commissions about every week. So if you're ever interested in watching me 3D model, I'd recommend you guys to come and visit and I'd love to chat with you guys. <laughs> Most of the time it's usually just about Nid though. She's still gone. She's. I bored her. She doesn't want to come back now. So if 3D modeling seems too daunting of a task to begin with, don't worry. There's still thousands of free models available online to get you started. So the most popular one is Thingiverse, which has literally millions of models on it. Um, I like My Mini Factory more because everything on My, My Mini Factory is like certified printable, whereas everything on Thingiverse can just be randomly uploaded and you never know if it's actually going to be able to print. So we have our 3D model and our 3D printer, and now we need some filament. So FDM printers work by turning spools of plastic into like our tiny little glue gun sticks, basically. So honestly, there's so many different types of filaments available on the market, and they all have their pros and cons. There's flexible filament, glow-in-the-dark filament, transparent filament, carbon fiber, metal infused, wood infused. There's, there's literally like a gazillion. Um, so for the most part, you'll most likely be printing in PLA filament, which is a a uh, natural-based filament. It's plant-based, but I mean, it's still plastic, so it's not that great for the environment. Oh, Nid, you came back! Come back, Nid. Okay, Nid's back. Oh, and my other print finished. 
everything's happening at once. So here's a box that I can't really show you of a whole bunch of types. So like this guy, this PETG, and they're super good for getting clear filament. So like mostly when you 3D print stuff, you can never get it to be 100% clear, but PETG is really good for that. Uh, this one is a wood-based filament, which is really cool because you can actually stain it like with actual wood stain and it smells good when it's printing like wood. And you can get, this one is called ABS. So ABS used to be the most standard filament before like the big boom in 3D printing. And one thing that's cool with ABS is that you can do an acetone vapor smoothing on it, which literally melts the outside of the plastic to make it all shiny and cute. And sadly you can't do that with PLA because the only equivalent chemical that does the same vapor melting is um, chloroform. So you can't do that with PLA. <laughs> What else? Oh, and this one's TPU. This one is flexible filament. This one's really fun. Oh, you can get different filaments that are squishier than others. This one's pretty stiff. Nid, no. I have all these examples on my desk. She wants to, she wants to take a peek. <laughs> okay. So how much can you print with a roll of filament? Oh, let me show you a, a whole roll of filament. Ugh. So this is like a kilogram of filament. It comes on a big roll like this. And each roll about is about $25 Canadian. So how much can you print with it? So it depends wildly on your settings, but you can print roughly 392 chess pieces, if that helps you get an idea of how much you can print. Um, okay, so another question is, where do you buy filament? So in Edmonton, because that's where I live, so that's where I know the examples, there is quite a few local shops. I think there's about three or four local stores in Edmonton that sell it. Um, otherwise, you can get it online super duper easily. And you can order it on Amazon, like, for the most part, within two days, you can order, like, any color you want. So, depending, after, like, the COVID 3D printing boom and everybody was printing PPE, most rolls were around $25, but it's jumped a little bit to $20 or to $30 since then. So, for comparison's sake, here's some fun facts. So, this Ganondorf sword was two and a half kilograms of PLA, so two and a half rolls. However, there was quite a few failed prints that were not included because most of those pieces were printing for around 12 hours. And if I wasn't there to swap the roll, then the, the print failed and it was very depressing. Which is another reason why I don't print five foot long swords anymore. It's too much work. Alternatively, you can print 27.7 Kirby statues with one roll of PLA. So since there's a bit of support material needed for the Kirby statues, you get a little bit less bang for your buck. But I mean, $25 for 27.7 Kirby statues isn't that big of a deal, right? Okay, so back to our Bowsette crown. So we have our model, our printer, and our, some material. So now we need a slicing program. So simply put, this is what converts our 3D model into a written instruction manual for your 3D printer. The three of most popular options right now are about Simplify 3D, Cura, Slicer, and then I think Prusa Slicer is pretty popular too. So using a different slicer can slightly change the appearance of your part since they're all writing instructions in different ways. So Simplify 3D has a lot of customizable settings allowing you more flexibility and options. However, it's not free. So lately, it's actually been falling behind in features compared to other open source programs. So it's not really the best choice. But when I got started back in 2016, it was basically the only choice. So that's why I still use it because I'm, I'm like a stubborn old man. <laughs> so Kira, on the other hand, is open source and they have a ton of like really neat and... No, that's against TOS, don't do that. <laughs> Um, Kira's free and they have a lot of really cool features, um, like their variable layer height feature and like their fuzzy wall feature. So for our examples here, all these screenshots will be from Simplify 3D because that's the program that I have. However, be sure to do whatever research on whatever slicer you end up using. Probably Kira because it's the free one and it's pretty good. So this is what my settings look like in Simplify 3D. You can orient your model, you can scale it, as well as change all the settings for your print. So shown here on the example is what the instructions look like for your printer. So what are some of the settings that we need to consider before we hit go? So one of the biggest factors when 3D printing is your layer height, since it affects the appearance and the amount of work you'll need to finish your prop. So since FDM printing is working by working... Oh, I need to talk. I'm talking so much, sorry. <laughs> since FDM printing works by laying down thousands of little layers, by changing the layer height to something smaller, like 0.01 millimeters, it increases the amount of layers and makes the overall print smoother. However, it literally can take three times as long. 
So by changing the layers to be something thicker, like 0.03 millimeters, you're able to print a lot quicker at the cost of a lo uh, lower resolution. So depending on the amount of detail in your print, a thinner layer height might not always be needed, or you can set up your model to change mid-print to have the best of both options. So this one won't be as effective. This is what I normally pass around. But like, this guy is... No, I'm pointing at the wrong one. This one is a super fine one. And you can see when I put in the light, like this guy, that's the 0.3. You can see the li rigid layers on the top there versus like here, there's like virtually none, right? Because the layers are so tiny that there's no steps. Okay, that's the best I can do. <laughs> um, so the majority, another thing you can change is the nozzle size. So the majority of 3D printers come with a standard 0.4 nozzle size. So this is good in comparison between quality and speed and works well for most applications. However, 3D printers are super modular machines and you can change basically everything about them. So by changing your nozzle size to be something bigger, you can print a lot faster at the cost of a lower resolution, or you can change to be a lot smaller to achieve even more details at the cost of a longer print time. So admittedly, most of those people most people don't ever bother changing their nozzle size, and I was one of those people up until like last year when I decided to give a 0.6 nozzle a try, and it was revolutionary, you guys. <laughs> so like last year when Kingdom Hearts 3 came out, I was printing a heck ton of keyblades, which are like really, really big, right? So each piece takes several hours to print, and when I finally changed the nozzle to be slightly bigger, parts were taking literally a third less time. So if it was like 12 hours, it would take like seven hours, and like that's huge when you're printing out commissions and you're literally printing out money you want to print money as fast as you can right so it's super easy to switch out your nozzle but you do have to tinker and calibrate your settings every time plus it's also a super cheap upgrade it's like less than a dollar for a nozzle so this next one is infill where are you infill there we go my little desk is covered in all these examples so infill is how hollow your print is so this is a super important um setting for all 3d prints since it can greatly alter the overall cost the part strength the print time the weight and even the surface finish so most prints that i do are around eight percent infill but depending on how durable the part needs to be i'll go up to about 20 percent so infill also comes in different patterns which can affect the integrity of the part and the speed it can be printed at so certain patterns are better for flexible filaments such as the concentric pattern which still allows it malleability while still providing strength and some patterns are simply for aesthetics if you're printing them with transparent filaments, for example. So people come up with new patterns all the time, and the most newest one I've seen is the gyroid infill, which is available on this GIF. Beyond looking super cool in time lapses, gyroid infills use less filament and produce better strength results than regular rectilinear infill. So let me show you an example. So, whoa. Like that's 100% infill, 80, 50. You can't even like tell the difference between these ones, right? Everything over 20% infill is basically a waste of your time and money. So like never go, sorry, never go above 20%. It's just not worth it. Unless you're printing like car parts, I guess. But but don't do that. I think that's illegal. <laughs> so the next one we have is shell. So another important setting in your slicer is how many walls do you want your print to have? So if you print it too thin when you're sanding your prints, you could lose the entire print, right? Like you'll dig right through it. It can also affect durable part strength and increase your printing time. So typically I add more walls to the surface, like the top levels of my print, since it makes it look a lot nicer. So for my perimeters, I stick around two to three layers. And my bottom, I stick around two usually. So adding layers to the top makes it print a lot nicer. So here's a lot of, here's like how thick eight walls would be. Beefy. It's unnecessary. Don't do that. Don't waste your plastic, guys. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I usually print with just two. But then I see like people print with three and I'm just like, that's wasting time and money, you guys. You don't need three. And next one we have is overhangs. Oh, this one's the big boy. This is the one that I always break every panel because I put it in a box and then all my pieces just break off. <laughs> So when you're 3D printing, all of your layers are placed one on top of each other. If there's nothing there to support the overhang, then the plastic will droop if it can't cool fast enough, and it'll cause the print to fail. Um, so by adding in supports, you're able to add towers of plastic that are designed to be removed once the print is finished. So these supports are usually very easy to remove with some pliers. However, they can also leave an unsightly finished edge on your final part. So depending on your model, you might require less... Um, when you're designing your model, you always want to use like an overhang of above 45 degrees because any lower than that and you'll risk having like droopy underhangs and like failed prints and it's it's avoidable. Just don't design them like that, you guys. 
I trust you. You'll do better than that. So here's here's fun picture. So this overhang print, it was it, it was printed in one piece. It broke many times. Look at Ned. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this was printed without any supports and like can I show you? The underside of it's really gross looking. Like you can see that. Not really. Oh no, the camera's out of focus. You can see like on these guys, like that's what the support looks like. And this one, these were all printed without supports. That's just the natural bridging. Depending on your cooling, you can print things a lot further and without droops, but it all depends on your fan setup, right? You can always upgrade your fans and upgrade everything on your printer, basically. So this one's cool. If you have a dual-ended extruder, you can print multiple materials at once. So you can even print water-soluble supports. So specifically designed for complex support material, it would be difficult to remove by hand. You can use PVA filament, which literally you just throw the print in some water after and the supports will dissolve on their own. So I haven't had the chance to work with this filament because I only have uh, single nozzle printers, but it would be really cool to do. <laughs> it looks creepy. I mean, it kind of does. It was the only GIF I could find, okay? <laughs> I don't have one of these printers. So another thing that you have to keep in mind is your print orientation. I don't know how well I can show you this, guys. I'll try. Um, so this is one of the things that newbies struggle the most, is how you orient your prints on the print bed. So how you arrange the model can affect a bunch of things, such as your part strength, your accuracy, how much support material you need, the, the finish, and the amount of seams you have to clean up afterwards. So if you have things such as text, it's better to print it facing its side, like up, rather than face up on the print bed. Because the standard nozzle is only 0.4 millimeters wide, if your text is any smaller than that, it won't be legible. Okay, so let me let me see how I can fit this. So this guy, this is a bayonetta gun. This guy was printed flat. So look at look at how look how poopy the text is. This is hard with it mirrored. Like you can't even read that. But this guy was printed so like, this was the bottom. Look how pretty that text is. Much better. Much better than the poopy text. Right? Plus you can see all the layer lines on this guy. Basically on there. Compared to this guy, it's all smooth and nice. Because this guy was printed like like that on the print bed. Always do that. Because then instead of having it 0.4 millimeters wide, you can go down to like whatever size you want it to be. Another thing is... Oh, this one's really fun. I love this one. Um, when you're 3D printing, you have the choice of tons of things of what you're printing onto. So you can get flexible magnetic sheets, plastic mats that are intended to provide really good adhesion, or just printing on plain old glass or blue tape. So personally, I prefer to print on glass with a tiny amount of hairspray because it leaves a mirror reflective finish on the bottom of your prints. But depending on what surface you're printing on, it can create a totally different appearance on the bottom. So printing straight onto glass will provide a mirror-like shine, while printing on paper's tape will give it a matte finish. But what if we take this even further than that? What if we go beyond? So this is printed on carbon fiber vinyl, and it looks like it has carbon fiber on it. Isn't that nuts? <laughs> And this one is printed on what's called a diffraction grating, which has like thousands of tiny little cuts on it that make it look like a rainbow. So by printing onto something like that, you can put rainbows on the bottom of your print. Isn't that so cool? Let me show you. I actually, these are my examples. So this is the carbon fiber one. Look at, that's my logo. That's the carbon fiber one. Oh, look at Vic's there. Nid took his chair. That's why he's kneeling. <laughs> and then we have, um, this is the one that was printed on diffraction grating. So it looks, well, it's hard to see the mirror on this one, or the rainbow, but it's there. I don't have very good lighting in my bedroom. Oh, oh, there, there's the rainbow. And um, this one was printed on painter's tape, so it's all rough and matte. And then this one was printed on glass, so it's all shiny. Don't let it reflect the mouse pad. Zeke, don't call me out like that. <laughs> Jeff Bezos is going to shut me down. <laughs> okay. So that's the... A lot of the settings but there's literally like a gazillion ones that you can change so shown here is print speed so typically the slower you go the higher print quality you'll get so the speed you can do is varied depending on the model printer you have so for reference my printer can only print on the average speed which is around 50 millimeters a second however if i'm printing something super tiny with a lot of details i slow it down to like half that to 30 millimeters a second you can go as slow as you want technically but remember it's just going to increase your print time so finally, to finish your 3D prints. So this is the most common way I've seen people do it. So on the top left is the ABS, which is like our little EV. How you melt the outsides of it to make it all shiny, basically. Um, so 
other people like to cover their prints in resin and another option is filler primer and sanding which is the option i go even though it really sucks <laughs> so the general process of finishing a print typically goes like this you print the print you sand the print you fill the gaps in the seams you sand some more you coat it with some filler primer you sand then more primer and then you repeat until you're sick of sanding and then you're then you're done so some per people just prefer to coat the entire thing with resin to hide the layer lines or do a combination of resin and sanding. So it entirely depends on what I'm treating for what method I use or how badly the surface area needs to be refinished. So on this part list, I included a Dremel, but be warned that sometimes a Dremel can't be used because it actually gets hotter than the filament melting point. So like if you're using it on PLA, for example, which is the most common material, it'll actually just like melt your print. And I say that with experience. <laughs> So back to making our Bowsette crown. So shown here is a time lapse of me printing it on my CR10. So to finish this crown for cosplay, I'm going to be doing the sanding and filling route. So this crown you think already looks pretty good. However, metallic paint will show every single fault in detail. If you zoom in a little closer, you can see a lot more problem areas. So curved areas are notorious for showing more layer lines, like on the top of the crown. On FDM prints, there's always going to be a seam line where the printer starts and stops each layer. So you can choose in your slicer where it's going to be, so it's important to make sure it's in a spot that's easy to sand. Another thing we need to fix up is the overhangs. So you can see on the bottom of the crown, there's, there's a bit of uneven filament since the printer was trying to print on thin air with nothing below it. The first thing I do in tackling my prints is go over the entire thing with a zebra nail file. These are thicker and stronger than normal wooden nail files, and they come in a variety of grits, so you can buy them at any beauty supply store for super duper cheap. So in this case, I'm starting out with my biggest grit, which is an 80 grit, to remove the large majority of plastic all over the entire print. So at the beginning, it's important to take off as much of the uneven plastic as you can before you move on to the smaller grits. So by the way, this is all footage from a scuffed YouTube tutorial that I made like two years ago. So I'll be updating it soon because I actually got commissioned to um, finish a full keyblade. So I'll be making a new one in the next couple of months of how to do a really big beefy prop from start 3D modeling to finish finished prop. <laughs> so next up we have our fillers. So filler primer is a spray can that you can buy at the hardware store and it's located in the automated automotive section of paints. It's designed to fill in scratches on cars so it's perfectly suited for filling in layer lines on 3D prints. It's also useful to have some sort of putty to fill in any large gaps and holes. You can use a lot of different materials like this but I prefer to use wood filler. Some other options include bondo spot putty, drywall spackle, plastic wood, you name it. The main goal here is to use something that adheres to the plastic, fills the gaps, and is easily sandable. I like wood filler since it's cheap, non-toxic, and can be easily watered down. If you're doing a print that has seams for multiple pieces, this is also how you'd fill in those gaps as well. The rest is going to seem really repetitive because it, it is. <laughs> you simply just keep moving on the grips with sanding and doing more layers of filler primer in between. I like to use different coats of filler primer between each coat because then you can see how much you've sanded away on each layer. Um, it's very tedious, to be honest, but it will get you very clean results if you put in the effort. So shown here on the bottom is the result after doing se three separate layers of filler primer up to 400 grit sanding. You can see how every step fixes it up a little bit at a time. You can stop at any time, of course, because I won't blame you because nobody actually likes sanding. It's also a good idea to keep in mind that metallic paint will show more imperfections than a matte paint would. So for this reason, I decided to focus more on the outer crown area that would be painted gold than the top area. And finally, to finish it off, I added some plain black primer and some gold spray paint. The black primer was optional, since filler primer is technically also a primer. However, I just wanted to make sure I had an even base coat underneath all of the gold. So now you guys see the process behind it all. It can take a lot of work, I admit, but this process can be used for the most basic props like a Bowsette crown to more complicated stuff like a diva gun. But if you view this panel in the past, that's be, that'd be where I'd be moving on to my printer recommendations. However, since you guys are the lucky ones, you get to see new and exclusive secret techniques that I've been working on. So what if, instead of sanding, you can use resin on our prints? The downside to resin is that it's usually thick, messy, and takes around 24 full hours to cure, so it can drip and run and be a total hassle. What if we switched up the type of resin we used? So this type of resin is actually from SLA printing. So with this one, I was literally combining both methods of 3D printing into one. So after printing the part, I used thin, light coats of SLA resin, curing it between each layer with a small UV flashlight. Since it only cures when you're ready, it's super easy to work with. The only caveat is that this resin is a bit pricey, but this 500ml bottle on Amazon was about $20, along with the flashlight being about $15. So I've hardly used a fraction of the resin, so I'll be able to use it to finish a ton of prints. The downside is that you have to be very nitpicky to keep your brush spotless, because you can get tiny crumbs embedded in the resin, and it's also good to do multiple pieces at a time, so one is curing while the other is painting. 
So now that I've shown you guys some really cool creations, I'm happy to give you guys some recommendations on affordable 3D printers. Of course, these are all my opinions, and I really encourage you to do your own research, because there's a ton of different things to consider when picking a printer, including like your build size, kit versus pre-assembled, etc, etc. One of the coolest part about 3D printing is being able to mod them. There are some free mods that all you need to do is 3D print them, and you'll literally be able to alter your machine right from that, like an upgraded fan duct. Some modifications can be done by purchasing better components for your printer. Of course, these are all optional upgrades. These printers run great from stock, but they can always be improved. So shown here in my closet are some of my Ender 3s and my CR10s and some of the modifications I have made to them. These have been done over years of printing, so don't worry about making all these changes to your brand new machine. My favorite modification by far is adding an OctoPrint server to my printers, which allows you to control them over the internet. So shown there is the app, what it looks like through my phone, and you can add plugins to these servers as well, which allows so many possibilities. So for example, I have a Discord bot for mine, so it little sends little cute updates from my printers when like the print finishes. And then another thing you can do is I even have an app on my smartwatch that I can control my printers from my smartwatch because it's 2020 and it's a wild time to be alive. So the first printer I'm going to recommend is the Ender 3. This is my the cheap printer I've been referencing the whole time. So I own three of these machines so I can personally vouch for them. If you're wanting to get a feel for 3D printing but don't want to spend a ton of money, this is definitely my best recommendation. Um, it's the Corelli Ender 3, which is the most popular hobby grade printer on the market right now. So one of the reasons that this printer is so cheap is that it's a partial kit, meaning you have to do some assembly yourself. Personally, I think this is a good thing since it means you learn a little bit more about your printer and understand it better because eventually you're going to run into some problems and need to do some repairs. So it's better to know a little bit about what you're tinkering with before you go head first. So the build size on this model is a little bit smaller than the next one I'm going to recommend you, but it's by no means limiting. Personally, I own three of these printers and they're amazing workhorses. There's also a newer upgraded model called the Ender 3 Pro, which is available, which is essentially the same model of the printer with a few quality of life upgrades, like the upgraded quieter power unit, the sturdy aluminum axis, and a magnetic print bed. However, the print, the print design and the build volume is the exact same, so it's up to you if you want to spend the extra money on the little few upgrades. Next up is the CR10 or the CR10S, which they're mainly known for one thing, which is their build volume. So for cosplay, that's a major, major major perk to have. So these are basically the exact same printer as the Ender 3, just a bigger size. If you plan on going into 3D printing specifically for cosplay and intend to print large props or helmets, having a bigger build volume cuts down on the post-processing time significantly. Of course, for their success, there comes imitation. So if you look at all the budget printers on the market, a lot of them look the exact same. So most 3D printers are manufactured in China, where there's little to no laws protecting intellectual property. So since the CR10 and Ender 3 designs were so successful, Basically, a lot of the other printers available look the exact same. So most of these companies more or less copied the exact same specs and then added some small quirk to theirs to make theirs slightly better. So like the Tebow Tornado, for example, has a direct drive extruder rather than a Bowden style setup, which is slightly cheaper. Keep in mind that the price can vary for a ton of reasons, including what the materials the printer is made of and if it's a full or assembled kit, that type of thing. And finally, this is my last recommendation. This is probably my dream printer, to be honest. So the Prusa series is very well known for their quality and standards, as well as a multitude of upgrades for their printers. So fun fact, I've been hosting this panel for over three years now, and this has always been the number one printer for the highest rated one across the board, always. So there's dozens of quality of life upgrades for this printer that simply aren't included on a lot of, a lot of other printers. Stuff that just like makes sense, you know? So most 3D printers are very, very dumb. They can destroy themselves really easily simply by digging the hot end into the bed or not homing properly. This printer, however, this printer's not dumb, you guys. <laughs> so say the power goes out. The printer will automatically move the nozzle to the side of the print so that the hot end doesn't melt the existing print and return to its previous spot when the, print the power returns. It knows when you've built the frame to be slightly not square and will automatically correct for any of those issues. It even knows when you've been impatient and pulled the SD card out of your computer too quickly, corrupting the G-code file. Almost every other printer would simply print this corrupted file and fail, but not this one. This one's better than that. I could honestly go on about this printer forever because it's like a dream printer for me. I'm like, I'm not a car person, but this to me is like the Cadillac of 3D printers. So I really want one, but I'm worried it'll make the, less, the, the rest of my printer children feel inadequate. So I just admire from afar instead. Of course, there's a lot more printers than the SCs. So there's a lot more very expensive printers for just these. But for the sake of this panel, I decided not to include anything over $1,000 Canadian because let's be honest, cosplay is expensive enough as a hobby and we don't need anything that pricey. So if any of these printers or price points pique your interest, I recommend doing your research. There are tons of printers in the best under 500 category or the best under 300 category. 
and these are constantly updating. So if you're saving up to buy one, make sure you don't just follow my suggestions since they're probably going to be outdated in six months. So Creality recently came up with the Ender 5, which is more of a love child between the CR10 and the Ender 3, so it's definitely a more viable option. So printers are always improving and becoming cheaper, so please don't let money be the reason to keep you out of this amazing hobby. A little bit of a fun thing before we wrap up. Sorry, I'm over time, Vic. I, he's, supposed to come, he's supposed to commentate for DBZ right now. Um, but we'll be quick. So cool prints. This is just stuff that I printed that I think is really cool and I, I need to show people. So this one is called a lithophane. So basically the thickness of the plastic determines how much light gets through. So the darker parts of the image are thicker and the lighter parts are thinner. So by reducing how much light you can go through the lithophane in certain areas, you can recreate an image. So most typically this is done in white filament, but using colored filament also provides really cool results. Um, okay, next one. So this one is actually better if I show it in person. So this one prints fat, flat like this, but it's actually, oh gosh, my desk is covered in things. Be careful, Nid. This one's like a full sword, but it prints in one piece. <laughs> Nid, be careful, it's dangerous. Oh, let me show you the lithophanes one here. So this one... Oh, it looks poopy without a light behind it. Two seconds. And now we have... No? Not good focus? There we go. That's me! That's me and Haley's Zelda cosplay. Yay! Okay, next one is... Oh, so the model for this sword actually comes in a ton of different shapes and sizes, and these are all available for free. So from broadswords to katanas, there's actually a ton of different swords you can do. Okay, last thing, giveaway time. So, um, I sadly don't have time to spend too much on this, but if you would like to win a Cursed Kirby, or you would like to win a GameCube controller stand, or any controller stand... Oh, okay. If you'd like to win a GameCube controller stand in whatever color you want. Actually, I can do more than just GameCube. So if you want like PlayStation 4 or something, let me know. Or Curse Kirby. Then spam cat gems in the chat, please. That's how you enter the giveaway. I'm I'm not memeing. Okay. Oh, I'm so overwhelmed. I've been talking so much. Um, <laughs> do any of you guys have any questions? I'm sorry if you asked any in the chat earlier. I haven't been able to look at the chat too much during the stream. The Rebel was sponsored, by the way. Hashtag sponsored. Okay. Wait, Katie won the giveaway! Katie, congrats! You got your own Kirby with legs! Unless you want the controller stand, you can have that too if you want. Um... How many should I give away? Can we do three giveaways, giveaway bot? Thanks, gobs! Is this for real? Yeah, Katie, you, you are the now the proud owner of this. Congrats, Katie. Oh, Hewald, congrats, kiddo. You can win your own cursed Kirby with legs and very fleshed out toes. Or you can win a controller stand. Let me know what you want. Let me know what you want, kiddos. <laughs> Best birthday present ever. Uh, I don't know if that's a very good birthday present. One more, what's the last winner? Oh, Andrew! Congrats! <laughs> you can have your own controller stand. Or you can have a Kirby. I don't know which one you'd want. Okay. That concludes my panel, you guys. If you do have any questions, feel free to message me on any of my social media. Or come hang out with my Discord, where we post cute animal pics and work in projects pictures. Or, yeah. You know. You can find me. I'm easy to find on the internet. Vic usually retweets everything I post anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for coming. Ugh. You're gonna get a 3D printer one day? That makes me so happy, Sean. Taking your daily thank you guys for coming. Never been so um, fun and easy.